that box be the equivalent of what you want your master inbox to be. Pump it with your questions, pump it with your comments, pump it with what you want, and we'll have every single question answered. There's a lot happening right now, so I want to go through it. So uh, yeah, throw it, throw it, throw it, throw it, throw it. Keep, keep them coming. We'll have them all answered. Um, Swapnil, is there anything that you sort of wanted to lead with? Uh, yes, I do. So for everybody, there was a surprise planned. Uh, unfortunately, Jesse won't be able to join us. Uh, but that surprise will still hold true. Um, I'm creating a thread on our Slack channel. Uh, I would ideally want you to drop your email IDs or just drop a thumbs up in that thread uh, along with your email IDs. Uh, Jesse had an amazing email deliverability and optimization checklist that he had prepared for all of you. Uh, and we had decided to do that giveaway for 10 winners and that still is valid. So please, please, please drop your email IDs with a, a thumbs up in a thread on the channel right now. And I pushed the thread out on our office hours channel. Uh, to lead to it's the in the smart lead Slack. If you don't have access, we'll drop you an invite right now. Give me a minute. I'm dropping the. Uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. Don't worry. I got it. 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 Uh, but to lead with, we ideally wanted to discuss the core uh, aspects of email deliverability, right? Uh, we wanted to start with that huge flowchart that Jesse had in place, uh, which was what are some of the factors that affect email deliverability. So, uh, All right. yeah, I'll jump in. I'll go, go for it. it. All right. Um, I'm gonna try keep this. Technical and non-technical. So if you've got questions, uh, sorry, please do not drop your emails here. <laughs> drop your emails in the Slack um, thread. We've got uh, we've got about 15 already popped in. Uh, 10 lucky people will get that deliverability checklist. We're actually going to try uh, sneak some of that into Smart Lead itself because it is pumping with value. Um, do you have the link for the Slack? Yeah, well, I just scrolled to the top. I've dropped it right there. Um, I don't know how to pin it, but so if you can pin it for me, that'll be great. Or you can yeah. pop it in. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, Sweet, 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 sweet. All right. So for everyone joining, um, I am not Jesse. As you can see, the hairlines are very different. The skin tone is definitely very different. Um, but we're going to try our best to keep you just as entertained and knowledge driven as well. So the first question dropped over here was what are the core factors affecting deliverability that we see nowadays? Um, one thing that I've noticed from multiple conversations with customers over here is if you do log in from one particular browser and you log in from another secondary browser, especially Google, they are fingerprinting your login access. So you need to ensure that you have consistency in how you're getting your accounts logged into. Do not log in from, if you're logging in from like a virtual assistant account in the Philippines or in India or wherever in the world it is, um, you need to ensure that there is consistency in the IP address. So ExpressVPN uh, from my understanding as well as NordVPN will give you consistent IPs now, from the second part, which is with respect to whether you get them to log in with the same fingerprinted Chrome address, that is complex, but you can definitely pull that off with something like browser stack. Um, I'm going way too deep over here, but th the goal of this conversation is deliverability. So we're going to jump into that. So browser stack will help you emulate that particular individual browser, and that fingerprint will be associated to that particular instance in that browser instance. So you can be protected and taken care of to ensure there's consistency in the browsers that are being used for sending out messages, just for reference for you. The second thing to consider, now it's become more of a topic. It's not anymore. It wasn't as small as it is. We have a bunch of players in the world that are doing the SMTP outbound sends, right? We've got the, um, in no particular order of reference, we've got Superwave. Um, we've got some Superwave people over here. We've got Mail Doso. We've got Mail Reef. We've got Mail Scale. We've got um, InfraMail. Uh, our infamous InfoMail, right? We've got a bunch of them in the market that are doing really well. Which tool do you prefer? Which tool do you suggest? We personally have no preference. What we have seen in a completely unbiased answer and, and to cause no offense to anyone over here. Yeah, please thread. Thank you, Eric, for dropping it on the Slack, the thread. Um, so just for reference, what we can tell you over here is the trend I've seen is when these software is released in the market and they're fresh and new, we tend to see very good value because they've got a very strong infrastructure pool set up. It's fresh, it's unique. They, do, <clears throat> they don't tend to have the over spamming that tends to happen when you reach scale. Then the second question comes up happening is once they start to reach scale, they tend to have very fluctuated results. You'll have some people give you a 90% open rates if that matters. And some people give you a near dead zero to 3% open rates. Now, 
whenever that happens, I, I urge you not to freak out and note that these tools are experimental in their own note as well. And they're doing something very complex and, and custom driven. So my suggestion over here is to test out three to four of these tools and see which one gives you consistent results. I know we have players like Eric, which we all know in the open market that has got consistent results from a bunch of these softwares, but none of them can be quote unquote recommended or not recommended blindly. Now, in a situation, uh, uh, Vibov does Brave browser or such priority. Yes, uh, Brave completely removes any sense of fingerprinting altogether because uh, fingerprinting are usually cookie driven. And since uh, Brave by default does not allow for cookies um, in, its, uh, in its base settings, you are completely fine to operate over there. Uh, yes, the thread is in the Office Hours channel, um, FYI. Confirming you're speaking, I'm speaking Arabic. No, Zoom, I'm speaking English. So if this shows up as Arabic subtitles, I'm sorry. <laughs> This is not on me, uh, but I'm speaking English, uh, not racist at all. Uh, but cool, let's jump into the third factor that matters. Um, I've said this in the past before, and we've seen this show up in the Slack channel a few times. What do you mean when you go ahead and have, um, please do not invite stuff, just we're recording it, we'll send it through to you. Um, what happens when my campaign kicks off? It has a really good open rate, and then my campaign drops. How many of us in the chat, just drop it in the chat, or how many of you have faced that particular issue where you kicked off with like a massive successful campaign and then boom, it's plummeted. Let's give it a second. Cool, all right, so we have a few people who have faced that. Now, there are three to four reasons as to why that happens. I'm going to cover that up with you very quickly. You can then decrypt and depick which one uh, applies to you per se. One, which is the most obvious answer, is you're not variating your copy. Now, that doesn't need to be spin tax because remember that Google, by nature, this is only specific to Google. I don't have the full details of Outlook. Google, by nature, does not have a lexical approach. It has a more semantic-driven approach right now, which means that it is not exactly using exact words. It's using a brief, like absorbing, it's absorbing variant words. So, hi, hello, how are you? Per Google are still the same thing, right? They're, they're, they're still the same note. Um, now, what that means is you want to change your spin tax a bit more. Instead of saying, hi, hello, how are you? It needs to go, hey, good morning. Nice to speak to you. So keep it a bit more variant so the copy has a bit more variety. And we have people in this space who will go against spin tags and say that doesn't matter. And that's perfectly fine. This is what we found as data on our side. You want to variate your copy as much as you can because it's by default. And we've seen it at this point. We've tested it enough times. If you go ahead and have the same copy that's marked as spam, then there is a very, very, very good chance that if you have that same copy in a very close note, go to another other email, it will most likely be marked as spam. Now, I ran this test about three and a half months ago, so the numbers would have changed. But what this means is we ran a word cloud comparison. Uh, this was just myself internally, a word cloud comparison among 300 leads. And when the copy was different by 70%, you're all good. But if the copy was similar by 70%, then that effectively meant that you've got similarity and then there's a chance that your copy is going to be marked as spam if a similar verbiage of copy is marked as spam. So that is one of the core points when you have a very high open rate at the beginning and that drops. It's a very good reason behind the fact that you basically got a system where your emails, your first emails are being marked as spam. So just keep that one in mind. Second point, which is a more obvious one, you've been blacklisted. Because guess what? If you're using unsubscribe links more recently, Google has introduced that concept as we've seen as of February. But now when you mark a lead as unsubscribe, just for reference, when you put an unsubscribe link on Smart Lead, it also adds it to the headers. So it allows the client to say unsubscribe. When you click on that, the immediate next option is mark a spam. It's, it's a very anti-pattern that Google has introduced, but we have to live with it. So if you do this, what that means is most of your emails will be marked as spam. What that does end up meaning is by nature, more of your emails are going to be moved to spam naturally, which then means that you're going to have more of your campaigns taper down by, by default as to how this concept of spam copy operates. Now, the third part, as a result of your copy being marked as spam, there's a good chance that your message gets propagated to UCL Protect or other spam blockers or blacklists, and then that results in your mailboxes being blacklisted. Once your mailboxes are blacklisted, then there's a higher chance that you will see a reduced open rate 
by default. So that's one thing. These are the three things that I would request you to consider when you have an open click to drop. Now, what's the solution? I've said the problems and the causalities of it. Solution is simple. Variate your copy. When I say variate your copy, run three to four different offer variations to your subject lines, to your personalizations. When I say that, I don't mean just spin tax, but completely different optionality. It's all together. You should be doing this if you're not doing this. You have to be doing this and use different uh, variations on Smartly because then you also get the advantage of tracking your analytics as to what combination is working. Now, for those who are doing this, please keep in mind, do not change more than one variable per variant. If you're changing your subject lines, change from A to B, B to C. If you're changing your first line personalization, keep everything else static. This will give you a very clear understanding of which combination works best. This is one-to-one -one paid advertising. Same concept applies over here for um, cold emails too. Cool. Uh, Swapnil, did you want to add anything? Yes. So for all the people that may or may not have experimented with spin tax, could you tell them what exactly is spin tax? Okay. Yeah. So for those uh, who are completely new to spin tax, it's effectively a concept of rotating your copy or adding certain verbiages or variations of your copy so that it's not the same email that's blasted out to, you know, 500 to a thousand plus emails. So you can open smartly. They have this option of putting curly brackets and saying, hi, hello, how are you? So then what that means is lead A will get high, lead B will get how, and sorry, uh, lead A will get high, lead B will get how are you, right? And then it keeps fluctuating the copy. It's just a way of bringing in some variance because in the end, you are not meant to send the same email a thousand times to a thousand different people. So that's the whole concept of uh, spin taxing over here. Yeah, uh, and also Weber, with respect to the three core factors that you mentioned regarding deliverability, right? Could you also tell people on uh, not only that, but with respect to the new center policies that are about to kick in, right? Uh, with Google, uh, Google already kicked in one set of center policies, which was there. How is that when users? So the, 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 the sender policy perspective is basically given, uh, we've spoken about this, it's to do with the, uh, how many emails can facilitate you being marked as spam under the same domain, which they currently set it up to be 0.3% on a domain level, which means if you send a thousand emails and three of them are marked as spam, post that, you need to be careful. Now, they've gone ahead and ensured that you are completely not affected in a B2B perspective. So if you hit another domain that is custom, you are fine. This is per their terms and the updates that they've made. If you hit at Gmail accounts, you are trouble. So by default, if you're sending emails to Gmail accounts thinking you're hitting personal emails, it's actually negative. So I would request you to review your strategy if that includes an at Gmail or personal email experience because you will be facilitating yourself to get marked as spam more often. And so, last question from my end to like, you know, uh, before we move yeah, go for it. to the information part is, um, how do people figure out whether they've been blacklisted or not? Are there any particular websites you can check yeah. this? Great question. So this is beginner friendly and uh, um, friendly for everyone else. Uh, MX Toolbox is the um, easiest one, right? Uh, MX Toolbox will give you the answer to most of your blacklisting softwares. Uh, it will let you know whether you're listed in the more uh, popular uh, blacklisting entities. Now, there are some more complex ones. Um, I will go ahead and share that in the same Slack thread after this uh, office hours. Um, that's a bit more technical. It's a bit more advanced, but it covers a wider range of uh, blacklisting engines. Now, what happens if you get listed on blacklist? Most of the time, they get you off the blacklist after 30 days. Like that's the general rotative cycle. But if you're very particular, you can always email them, give them a petition, tell them that this won't happen again. And we didn't do this on purpose. We follow all the protocols and there's a good chance they'll remove you from it. One more point to mention over here. Some of you may have raised the thought thinking that your IPs that are associated to sending are from smart lead. They're not we hook onto your SMTP to send messages on your behalf. So the originating request is from your SMTP. So now then that propagates onto from your originating SMTP, which is your Gmail Outlook, your private SMTP provider to your DNS network, right? And your DNS network would be where your dom domain is hosted. So you want to ensure that you're being particular about where you're buying your domains. Just for reference, Namecheap is still bombarded right now and they are still flagged. Um, by a few blacklists, 
which can have a net negative effect when you buy the domain. If you already have a domain from Namecheap, you can just transfer it across to GoDaddy, um, Cloudflare, or any of the um, open software markets uh, available. You can also use Google's um, Squarespace version um, of their Google domains. It's not that bad, to be honest with you. But I tend to just stick to um, GoDaddy or uh, uh, Cloudflare. Cloudflare, some people have said it has been blacklisted. There was this whole spam message, uh, some, this viral message pushed out on LinkedIn about it. Um, I personally have not seen any net negative effects. We have a lot of core domains on uh, Cloudflare. It works fine. I have noticed one thing though on that note is domains and tenants that are bought from Outlook in Southeast Asia are seeing pretty high bounce rates on our side. They're just being rejected as spam. Um, and the message is quite clear. It says messages from, from these IP are being rejected. Obviously, the first thing we think is something to do smart lead. So we send emails, even we think maybe smart lead. Um, so we go send, we log into the mailbox directly and send a message. But even when we log into the client, they are being bounced. So we've had a situation where we've had to burn like, you know, almost 40 something mailboxes and domains that we got from that tenant and go to a new tenant uh, that's in a separate uh, entity. For, so I know for reference, that's some of the stuff that um, Jay set up. Um, we'll, uh, I'll share with you later. But um, cool. Is there any other question that you wanted me to cover? So I know there's a ton of questions in the chat. Uh, yeah. So the through. last controversial question before we move on to the automation and the uh, you know security part of it, uh, which is uh, a lot of people have this on their minds for sure, which is Outlook versus Gmail. Which one to use? Yeah. And and how do you reach out to personal Gmail accounts if you're trying to target small business owners who only have personal Gmail IDs and not business domains? Oh, that, that's a that's a great question. Um, Outlook versus Gmail, I don't have an answer. Like each, I will record this video, you watch the same video in a few weeks and it'll be a completely polarized answer. So keep it split, keep it, uh, keep it um, diverse. Um, it will really help you with your testing, to be honest with you. We have predominantly Outlook accounts on our side and we clearly have seen the brunt of it. So we're moving to, we're probably gonna be moving to Gmail for some of the accounts. So I don't have an answer on what works better than the other, but one stat is factual and correct, which is, Outlook allows Outlook. So if you're reaching out to Fortune 5000, I believe it's 80% coverage that Outlook has to Fortune 5000. So you're you're better off um, reaching out using Outlook. That's what I would recommend if uh, I were you. Uh, an easy solution we have is the ESP matching as some of you have used that will really make your life better. So you don't need to do any sort of manual work. We'll figure out whether your leads email account is Outlook and we'll match it with any existing Outlook accounts that we have access to in your portfolio of mailboxes. I'm going to randomly pick questions. Uh, Swapnil, is that okay? Uh, just if you can, before taking the questions, can you just quickly cover one small aspect on the email infra part? Because there have been a lot of questions, not only on our Slack, but also by users to understand uh, how should I be setting up my email infra, right? Uh, and if you could take like, let's say a simple sample set of, let's say 10 domains being purchased, right? What are the do's and don'ts there? Uh, how many... Mailboxes should be setting up per domain, so on and so forth. Oh, how pedantic am I meant to go on a scale of zero to neurotic? Neurotic. neurotic. Okay. <laughs> All right. If I were to go neurotic, then I will not get the 10 domains from the same DNS provider. I'll get them from GoDaddy. I'll get them from Namecheap. And I'll also get them from um, uh, Cloudflare. I know I've said Namecheap as blacklisting, but you can buy them and then push them across. Uh, you can also get them from uh, Porkbun. And you can also get them from uh, HostGator. Do not use any of these mailbox, these DNS providers, self-provided mailboxes. If you use them, shame on you. Do not use them. How dare you use them and then charge your clients $5,000 a month. Shame on you. Don't do that. Use Gmail or Outlook. But you can use any of these to buy your domains. So two to two, split into each of these, right? So completely separate DNS um, and DNS IPs. Once I've done that, I'm immediately going to push them through MX Toolbox or the other tool that I'll send you through. Uh, where you can see if they're blacklisted. If they're blacklisted, you can immediately message the customer support with the link, tell them I'm blacklisted, move, you, move me to a separate IP. Done, sweet. Next step, we want to go ahead and basically set up separate tenants. So since I basically said this, if I want to test out an SMTP provider because I want to do some large scale sending, I will set up about six, uh, three on Gmail, um, three on Outlook, and I'll set up four on uh, SMTP like Superwave or so on and so forth. Um, four domains, but I believe these tools offer only one domain, hundred mailboxes. So I'll maybe split that up and say uh, four domains, Gmail, four domains, Outlook, and two domains, 
uh, the private SMTP networks. And I might test two of them together. Cool. And then once that's done, I will take these four domains that I have specific for Google and open them in a 10 to five ratio. That means I have 10 domains per tenant, and then I have three mailboxes per domain. And I'm sending about 35 messages per mailbox. There's nothing to do with deliverability here. It's purely a concept that if a tenant burns that, then you, you've you just lost three to four mailboxes. You've not lost more than them. Your business doesn't die. Like for us, example, who did not follow the practices that we said we follow, we now lost 40 mailboxes because I set up 40 mailboxes in one tenant. So that's on me, right? So now I need to, I've lost 40 domains and I need to push that to another setup. It's going to take me two weeks to create. Um, but luckily, you know, we got inbound and outbound as well. Uh, thank you, Sopna. So as a result of that, uh, we have that diversity. So if you have that diversity, great, but otherwise I'm kind of stuck, um, you know, losing all those domains. So repeating again, four domains set up on one single Google tenant, four domains set up on one Google Outlook tenant, two separate credit cards, if I can do that, and then two domains set up on a super wave and like, I don't know, mail dose or mail, whatever, any of the tools out there in the market that you can use. Bebe, the credit cards are important. Yes. Sorry to cut you short. Can you quickly explain what a tenant is? users? Yes. A tenant is basically an admin account in which it owns the rest of the accounts. So whenever you set up for these workspaces, you can't just set up a single workspace. They'll create you as an admin. So the admin can own a bunch of subsidiary or secondary domains in the language of Google. So to con not to confuse you. So when you create an admin account, let's say smartly.ai, never use a primary domain, but and this is just an example. Uh, let's say I'm using something called getsmartly.ai. Within that, I can add a bunch of secondary domains that are not my primary domain to then create mailboxes under those domains to send out messages. So that's a tenant for anyone who's asking. Cool. All right. So once that's done, I am now doing 25 to 30 messages per mailbox per day. Sorry, 35 messages per mailbox per day across these. So my volume is definitive according to these. Um, I'm warning them, warming them up for two weeks. Uh, I'm right now testing a ramp up of about three to five, not just five. The default is just five on smart lead, but just FYI, you can also try three. Uh, that works fine. Post two days, you want to start sending out messages as a one to one ratio, then a two to one ratio, then a three to one ratio. Why? Because like I said, I'm neurotic. I'm testing and trying to see which one works best for me. So some people, one to one ratio works well. That means 25 warm up emails, 25 outbound messages. Then your question comes down to me. All right, V. What is my warm-up reply rate? Should it be 100%? No, never. You should not have it as 100%. You should keep it anywhere between 40 to 60%. Because you tell me the last normal human who replied to 100% of all the emails they've received. No one, right? Do not fall under that fallus of whichever guru has sent you that course saying you need to get 100% reply rate. The goal, every one of us over here, 123 on Zoom plus how many ever are on Facebook and Slack or whatever, whatever 250, 300 people here, do not keep any robotic experience in your business. The goal of every one of our jobs over here is to make it look as human as possible while doing as little work as possible, right? That's basically what we're trying to achieve over here. And the more you keep it robotic, the more likely it's going to go ahead and cause an issue. And fleeting thought, if you don't mind, Swapnil, I'll jump back to the original point. You know how people, uh, I said, your open rates drop? Two other factors you need to also consider, right? You find me a human being that logs in at nine o'clock EST every single day, sends a message at nine o three, nine o six, nine o nine, nine twelve, nine fifteen, nine eighteen. Pause. Nine twenty two. Nine. No one does that. It's not human, right? You want to change your variance. You want to log in after one week and then maybe change that from every five minutes to every seven minutes. Don't do five o'clock to five fifteen to to six fifteen. These are the things that you need to bring into place to bring that change. Your question might say, hey, does that mean smartly send it robotically? No, we've already adjusted for randomization in the algorithm. We never send it in the exact same periodic commands. We split up for you. But these are things you can do to introduce variance into your sending cycle and improve your um, sending volume as well as your deliverability. Am I speaking out of my ass? Great question. No, I'm not. This is unfortunately part of my job to read into all of your people's mailboxes, jump on calls with most of you when you're facing delivery issues and try to figure out what some of you are doing. And some of you are really, really, really smart. And a lot of these are your ideas, not mine. So these are some of the things other people do. And I'm just sharing with you because I've asked them for their consent and they've let me know that I can share this. So those are some of the things you can also bring in for delivery. Is it a bit of work? Yes. But one last point, sorry. You can automate 95% of what I've said. 
that was someone okay. asking what is your age <laughs> <laughs> um i am at youth uh, azhar khan i'm at youth um 27 plus whatever you want to add on top of it am i 27 no i'm not um but no 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 that is uh, that is uh, how to get rid of uh, 27 <laughs> 15 um, i'm 27 i i i've stopped aging after 27 um after that is just a plus cool now uh, i know we're well past this but we've got a whole bunch of people over here who are engaged so i'm going to take on some questions so we'll take a bunch of questions uh, yeah. for that folks uh, to give everybody a fair opportunity so that everybody gets their questions answered can you please raise your hands i'm going to, and keep your videos on so that i can spotlight you we can all get the questions asked one by one we are going to enter, entertain a total of 10 questions and then post that i'm also going to drop a thread on the slack for all of you to drop your questions so that we can answer it there uh please switch on your videos as well so that i can spotlight you so that you can ask your questions uh and i apologize i'm not going to be rude if if we're not going to have double questions it's just going to be one question so please ask that one question um cuz just to make it fair for everyone else so yeah. so so no um you can okay. you can roll. uh let's get started with john uh just give me a minute spotlighting you go for it john ask your question you're muted mate i'll ask you to unmute yourself oh thank you um okay so i'm in a community and somebody said get ready for april 1st uh it it sounded like google was like enforcing a lot of new policies um and then they also said that smart lead was going to start booting people from warming if you're not compliant and i didn't really get a good answer of what that meant is there any validity to that or is that just talk i i love that people are saying stuff about us that even we don't know <laughs> no we're not booting anyone but yeah of course if you don't follow basic policies between the warm up system you're going to get blocked automatically we don't boot you out but you'll automatically get blocked like if you don't have your spf and dmark set up someone else's mailbox is going to bounce you and when you get bounced you're automatically removed from the the warm up system so by default if you have your basic security policy set up you're good to go we're not going to do much right um okay that's one second with april i do not have any feedback with respect to that right now i don't want to give you any whatever i say right now is going to get recorded and similar to someone who pushed some message out in some community is going to take this message and push it on slack and linkedin and a bunch of places so um i will give you any feedback on any policy updates once it's released and once i actually have some formative data okay so i know i know you said just one question yeah, sure. this is kind of this is in yeah. the same line um so you said just spf dmark dcam uh if you're not doing those like that's going to get you blocked from warming and stuff is that everything like as long as you're compliant with those things or is there anything else that could be affecting like my warm up pool if you're blocked so here's the thing right if you've set up the base security policies right you're good to go on our side but if you're blacklisted and someone else's systems are set up with a p0 like your dmark is set to p0 which is basically saying um kick me off if i got any sort of security issues then what ends up happening is you send a message to another mailbox that is part of like a very big organization right and that's the advantage you get with our warm up that organization may do checks on their top level because they're using outlook to see if you're part of any blacklist and if you're part of any blacklist it will bounce your message and because it bounces your message we're going to pick it up as you being the cause of that bounce and we'll remove you and the reason is also usually shared in that yellow banner that's given to you you just need to then go sort out the issues fix it and then join back on thank you man i appreciate it thank you yes, thanks on drive safe all right um uh, moving on to the next one just give me a minute removing from spotlight uh we've got andy go for it andy Hey, boy, uh, Viva! Thank you for filling up for Jesse for today. No worries, man. So, look, uh, I have a quick question regarding email tracking uh, domain. Uh, if I don't track um, open rates to, to regarding better availability, it doesn't make sense to even have that email tracking domain in the email. No, no, no. yeah, don't remove it all together. Like, uh, go with plain text emails. Don't don't select the option that says "Do not track," because even mm-hmm. if you do not track, it's still going to be an HTML email. um go ahead and just uh, click on send us plain text emails okay and should i remove the um custom tracking domain from the general no no that if if you select on um plain text emails we remove that anyway for you so you don't need to worry because okay. then you'll have to remove it and add it and remove leave that there 
just on a campaign level, just select um, plain text emails. Just a flag. If you do that, you cannot turn it back on until the campaign finishes. Sure. Thanks, man. Lovely. Thanks, Andy. Alrighty. Uh, next, we have Douglas. Douglas, go for it. Hey, V. Thanks for doing this. Um, a question around Clay. I've seen a few people in the chat feed you know, talk about LinkedIn scraping and everything like that. Um, will you guys have anyone from Clay on in the future that might be able to go through a demo and kind of how that, that links yeah. between Clay and Smartly? That'd be awesome to 100%. see. 100%. Yeah. 100%. We've, awesome. Uh, we've, we've already got that in our in our whatever, but this gives us even more incentive. Yeah, 100% for sure. Very cool. Thank you so much. Easy. Yeah. Thank you. Great call out. Okay. Uh, we've got uh, Vitali next. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I, I'm a, I'm an engineer, but I'm a beginner in emailing. You guys are speaking such a technical language that uh, I'm trying to catch up. Um, my question is, well, maybe there's two parts. One is, if I don't want to, I mean, deliver. It seems like it's a very technical, becoming a very technical field, all on its own. This deliver. And if I don't want to have the headache, uh, but at the same time I can't pay a lot for a professional email marketing. Guys, what's the solution? That's the first question. Do you have someone who said, you know what? Go and get this agency. They are very affordable. They work with us. You know, so you know, so that's one one question. The other question is, it sounds like the you send the the, the emails, but then there's a whole part about scraping emails from LinkedIn, which is a, like, and I'm, and I'm like, really? And now I have to learn a whole other. Um, so how do I combine the two? So I don't, no, I don't have fair. to run between you and LinkedIn and all this no, other stuff. Fair. Right. So look, my job is to make it sound complex so that you stay on. I'm joking, um, but uh, <laughs> um, it, it's it's not. Look, we we have these sessions so that we don't have beginner chat, right? Because a lot of the beginner chat can be found online. The goal of these sessions over here are to really dive in to the nitty gritty. The the stuff that's shared over here will never have a blog written about because no one's going to search for these type of stuff, right? Um, the people over here that you see, most of them are are running fairly large agencies or growing agencies that are going to become large or doing volume. So A, don't get intimidated. So uh, I hope you don't use this as a concept of getting intimidated. That's not the goal. In the simplest format, if you're reaching out to like a thousand people, go on Clay, easy tool, or even more so easier, Apollo. Find a bunch of people you want to send emails to. Maybe it's CEOs of gaming companies, right? Apollo makes it very easy to find that. Click on the button that says export leads, right? You'll get a bunch of email addresses. Get five mailboxes to 10 mailboxes. You can do that in a single uh, domain, right? Don't listen to any of the things I said, right? Get a single domain, 10 mailboxes. You have to warm it up. That's just part of just the game. There's no mats in that. Just click a button and it's done. Wait for a few days and then send your emails out. That's it. Like removing any complexity without making this sound more fancy than it is. That's all you're doing, right? The stuff that I added, all these dramatic terms and words I'm using are some of these people over here in this, whatever are sending like 3 million emails, 3 million leads and 15 million emails a month. Like their volume is high. Right. And it doesn't need to be that high. You can be sending, you can be in the pro plan at 30,000 leads and 150,000 emails, which is also not natural for someone to do these points, at, you know, point to you. So if you're doing, you're just kicking off, um, don't get too nervous or whatever. Just find a bunch of leads on Apollo, push them onto the product, click send, and wait for replies to come. Got it. Thank you. Cool. Um, you just le learn to walk first, then you can get to run, and then be Superman. Yeah, I, I did, by the way, I did do that, and I killed my domain. I had a name change. Uh, yeah, it's and all good. Killed um, it. And, and absolutely learned, killed it. <laughs> you learned from that. You move on to the next one. Um, it, it's perfectly. I mean. I've killed 40 domains, 40 mailboxes, as I just said. So, you know, welcome Absolutely. to the club. So don't worry about thank it. Thank you. Thank cool. you. Sweet. We'll, we'll take uh, four more questions. Yep. Uh, we've got uh, Asim Tazi here next. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Almost, but it's all right. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, well, quick question about links. So good practice is don't send links, unwanted links, have your emails as as clean as possible um i've run a lot of tests and like just in terms of open rates i don't see a lot of uh of impact but maybe that's because i am allowing open rates in general so i want to ask about uh um, domain reputation in terms of the links you're putting in your emails and how 
what is usually what what do you see in terms of uh, impact on deliverability and all? So by nature, um, so I, I just want to add this because you know again, Vitaly raised a good point. So it's just running in the back of my head. Um, I, I'm not a doctor. I'm just an engineer. Uh, I, I do not. I have not spent my time studying that much, right? Um, if you come to a doctor and ask the doctor, hey, how much sugar should I have? I'm going to tell you the least amount of sugar you need to run your body, right? Because my job is to keep you safe. But you go to a gym trainer, he or she is going to pump you up with like 10 kilos of protein and like fish and like chicken that is way normal for you to, you know, jack up. But it works because you want to be like him or her, right? So what I give is generalistic advice that helps everyone. But if something's working for you, do what's working for you, right? That's what I would always say. I know that that's a lazy answer, but now if you want to go with my perspective, do not use links, right? By nature, the concept is very simple. If we go beyond the principle of why this matters, the emails that have HTML in them are usually subscription emails, AKA marketing emails, right? Marketing emails by nature have a low engagement rate. They're built predominantly for clicks, and for execution of getting people to buy something, right? That's how they work. The same concept as newsletters as well. So these ESPs, as smart as they are, they, they're also what we call um, idealistic ESPs. That means they use identity vectors to figure out what is and what isn't. It's not a human. It can't understand cognitively whether this is uh, a newsletter or not, but it uses basic parameters saying, does it have a header tag? Does it have script tags? Does it have tracking tags? Does it have a button? Does it have a link that looks like a button? Great. These characteristics in the most basic version of classical, uh, uh, sorry, um, categorization machine learning is what we call a, a, a newsletter, right? That's, that's a basic classification model, right? So when you go ahead and send links or you have multiple CTAs, you're effectively emulating in this very, very basic nascent, you know, classification algorithm that you are a promotional email. But when you take work emails, Work emails are plain text. Now, work emails also send links. You have people in offices speaking to each other sending links, right? So it's not like just no links or links make a difference. And sometimes there's also signatures. But the premise over here is the way you attach these links and the way you operate through those, those make the bigger difference. So to then answer your second question, does the quote unquote domain reputation make a difference? Yes, absolutely. If you go ahead and put a random crypto link on your website, uh, a crypto link in your email, a very good chance that you're going to be marked as spam because Google is the same engine that owns both Google itself and Gmail too. So they know the spam scores. So every anyone who does SEO here, we know we have spam scores and a whole bunch of stuff, right? Those same metrics also matter and apply when you attach domains here. All of this tried and tested. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, man. Uh, next, we have Martin. I'm gonna raise my hand as a sink. Oh, hey guys. Hey Martin. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. So okay. basically my question was that um, basically like all all accounts get like their health uh, declines basically over time, right? And what's usually the time after which the health really starts to like go down? Because I've uh, it's probably the mistake uh, of it's probably my mistake and the mistake of the like the quality of the lead list I'm using is probably not that good. But uh, for me, the, like the health just started to declining like after like a week, maybe a week and a half. So is that normal or no? is that bad? It's, it's bad. Um, that's not, I mean, <laughs> it, it's not ideal. Um, I, I know Eric's not here. I was actually searching for him. But like you take people like Eric, Enzo or Nick, right? Um, they, they've they probably got the same domains running for months and they they usually have really good open rates because I go onto their like, you know, uh, campaigns and look at their stuff, et cetera. And they do really, really well. Um, and their opens are good and healthy. A lot of it is because they send high volume, but very segmented. So there's a lot of experimentation testing happening over here. Um, if you're seeing a big drop over a very quick time period, it would be any of the points that I've mentioned at the beginning. I know this is a recorded video, so you can check it out after to get a sense of understanding um, of what those points are. Um, that will give you some sort of, you know, leverage as to why you're getting that happen. You can also then figure out whether your lead quality is making sense because 
bounce rate, spam cycles, et cetera, et cetera, would make a big difference. Um, so I think Paul said the very good point there. Uh, you, you would probably want to, um, you know, how these people do segmentations. So take someone like Eric who does a lot of hyper experimentation. He'll take like a pool of leads. And I, I don't want to speak on his behalf at all. I have no idea of his exact strategy here, but I would say someone like Eric who understands segmentation really well should take um, a list of leads, let's say 5,000 leads, and then segregate those leads into certain categorizations because of how he's pulled his leads to create. It can be played through a bunch of different, maybe uh, leads based upon the number of employees in a certain team, leads based upon um, how long uh, a lead has been at a company, whatever segments that he wants to sort of run, because he's going to take those leads and run different angles for each of those leads. So I think when you do tests like that, the lead quality can be the same, but the offer to personalization to relevance ratio really changes. Um, so that's what I would recommend. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Like you just have to, just trying to make the make the emails like actually relevant to the people. That's it. Like it's saying. it's really yeah. not that hard. Like, I, I mean, it's hard, but it's really not that hard. Like, sorry, it's a stupid thing with Mac. Um, but yeah, thumbs up. That's basically it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the cool. answer. No thanks, Martin. Next we have Lucas. Uh, hey guys. By the way, I love these webinars. I think these are very engaging and I learn a lot. So I appreciate it. Uh, just a quick sanity check. So let's just say I'm sending out 35 cold emails a day from one inbox. Um, would you allocate a percentage of those to warm emails or would you stack, let's say 10 warm emails on that? And if so, what's the reply rate, reply rate on those emails just to help? Yeah, great question. Um, very, very, I think someone dropped this question a few days ago on the chat in a few groups saying, Hey, I want to make like a 50% ratio. How do I do this? Um, <clears throat> so with, with SL, our reply rate is a maximum. So if we say 80%, it's not going to hit 80% every day. It's a uh, 80% maximum. Cause again, variance makes a big difference. So to answer your question, you have 35 doing outbound. Can I do 10 stacked on top? Yeah. Um, 45 is still perfectly okay. 60 is also like you can push it, right? If you if you really see it working well. Um, safety note from just calls and chats that we're having right now is 35. But again, that really depends. Like, you know your mailbox is better and you can feel it and test it and, and see yourself. Like disconnects and um, early drops, those are signals to help you out. But to answer your question, 35, you want to send out as messages. And then after that, if you only have a 10 as a variance, then I would actually recommend you to turn on the auto adjust. Uh, it's a very elusive feature that not a lot of people understand or have read into, but all it's doing is it's preventing you from manually turning on warm up and on and off so that you're not oversending. Because if you don't have that turned on and you're sending 40 warm up emails, then you're te technically actually sending 35 plus 40. You're going to be sending 75 messages. Right, because does it prioritize uh, warm or outbound? No, no, no. It doesn't prioritize. It, it ensures at the end of the day they all get sent. But and you, but we also maintain a minimum time gap to ensure that they're not, you know, cross sending. Right. So to that point, um, in that situation where you're sending forty and thirty five as an example, then you probably want to keep your reply rate somewhere to about thirty to forty percent on the warm up emails. And then if you see, so you see your reply rate drop, you'd want to like a fight your dropping reply rate by increasing the reply rate on the warm-up emails. That's a like a, a way to offset it. Now the auto adjust feature actually does that for you. So if you send out 10, uh, it, it limits itself to 10 emails, right? But if you go ahead and have a drop in your reply, we have a few data points and uh, algorithm stuff that we've done a few months ago that does this. But if we see that your campaign or mailboxes are struggling, then it basically automatically boosts up the reply rate to, to, counter the drop in reply rate that it's seeing in a particular mailbox. So it's a feature that's done and it's built and it's it's automated. So use it like it's there, it's for free um, is what I, I'm basically saying. But um, long answer short, um, 35 is fine. You want to send 10 on top, send it between 40 to 60% in reply rate. If you see that is not helping you too much, push it up to 80%. And that will basically offset a drop in your 35 uh, 35 mailboxes that are being, uh, leads that are being reached out to. Weber, one quick thing to add here. So, so sorry, Lucas. Yes. So this is to answer your question only, which is what is the upper limit of the number of emails a person can send depending on their respective mailboxes? If you could just give a quick insight into that. Along sure. with, could you also tell, like, so to Lucas to answer this, because I've spoken to a lot of smart lead customers myself, many of them keep on varying it between, like, let's say they keep it 30, 20, 40, 10, and there are some that even keep it 30, 30. 
right? Uh, it's just a matter of understanding how they're affecting your reply rates and your uh, deliverability and accordingly adjusting it. And as Weber mentioned, just make sure you keep the auto adjust on because that's what it's going to do. It's going to make up for that variance. Yep, nailed it. Thank you. Crush it. Thank you. Um, Lucas, were you adding something or all good? Uh, I forgot, I but... Okay, I'll, drop it on. I'll drop it on Slack. We'll we'll, we'll find it after. Cool. Uh, um, sweet. I last question. Maintain one last question, which is Sam. Sam, go for it. My quick question. Um, do you need an unsubscribe link uh, in in terms of like the the can spam and GDPR rules, or is it enough if you just put like if you don't want to hear from me, the first reply stop or something like that? Sweet. I would give a very Casual answer if I was not being recorded, but since we're being recorded, I need to give you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um. The, um. You need to go ahead and have the unsubscribe link if you're well, reaching out to GDPR compliant. Get a hot one. There's a lot of echo. Um. Sam, so I'm just gonna mute you. That's where it came from. Oh, someone else is speaking. Wait. Yeah, it wasn't me. <laughs> oh, that wasn't you. Sorry. No, uh, can you just find? Did you do something on the bar? Put on the wait. Or... Okay. Cool. You muted everyone. Sweet, thank you. Um, hopefully that person waited at the bar. Um, but uh, Sam, to answer your question, you can basically go ahead and um, not have the unsubscribe link if you're reaching out to certain parts of the world, uh, usually the Western hemisphere of the world, but you're reaching out to anywhere in Europe. I would not even think about not having the unsubscribe link there. But then again, I have been challenged on this on Slack where someone said they have asked their lawyer and their lawyer said that as long as you're reaching out to uh, companies in a compliant way, um, which is sending out messages with an unsubscribe link, uh, with that unsubscribe link, but having a one prompt message saying, if you don't want to hear from me, stop, um, you're fine. But that's what he said. It's a random person on the internet, but it's from a gray our perspective, area. yeah, it's a great, from my perspective, if we hit the, the States, we, we tend to leave a, a, a message saying, Hey, if you don't hear from us, let us know and we'll stop. But if we were to hear EU, um, EU in general, it would always be unsubscribe link, but there are a lot of people in this chat in Slack that are like literally from Europe and spend a lot of their email ad band only on Europe. So you're best just dropping that message on Slack and getting advice directly from them. They know way better than I do. Right. Okay. Appreciate it, man. No worries at all. Um, sweet team. You have all been fabulous. Thank you. Um, have a fantastic day. It's the start of the day in the US, the end of the day in the rest of the world, uh, mid of the day in Europe. Have a fantastic day. This video is recorded. It will be shared on Slack. Um, you will have it with you. Drop any questions you have in Slack. If you have questions here that weren't answered, drop it in Slack. It will be answered. Welcome. Thank you for everything you do with Smart Lead. Um, thank you for your support. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your assistance. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you, folks. Oh, I love it. That was completely unplanned. Before you drop off, please do forget, uh, don't forget to add your names on the thread because we are going to be selecting 10 lucky winners and you're going to get Jesse's top email deliverability checklist. Uh, and only 10 lucky winners are going to get it. So yeah, don't forget that. I'm going to keep doing this until we leave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Folks. Have a good day. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Thank you.